we've been talking about the temple of God. The first temple that God commissioned them to build uh, back in the wilderness. Now, uh, that's accurate because the first temple was, was mostly a tent. Give me an amen, please. It wasn't until Solomon that they built the, the solid one, the, the, the permanent one that was going to stay. They did this, of course, because they were on the move. And so God's presence would lead them. And, and when his presence would stop, they would stop. And if they were going to be there for a while, they'd go ahead and put this tent up and they'd start with temple worship. And then when they got ready to move, the Levites would, would take it all down and carry it and, and move it to the next place. And uh, in his, uh, Exodus, rather, excuse me, Exodus 25 and 8, Noah, put, it, put up our, our scripture. This was God's command. Have the people of Israel build me a holy sanctuary so I can live among them. And so this is our third message on the temple. Uh, and we're looking at different aspects of the temple and how that applies to us here today. Now, how many of you know that we, we believe that this building is the temple of God? Give me an amen. But then the Bible also says that our bodies are the temple of God. I need an amen right there. Now, we set aside this building as a place of corporate worship. And so we ask God to fill this place with his presence. And, and we try and respect the house in certain ways. I know that. Some of you kind of were raised up in church. Some of you weren't. But I, I got to tell you, with it, without God, this is just a building. And there's no guarantee he's going to come and be here just because it's a church with a steeple on top of it. I need an amen right there. It's about our desire for God. It's about our desire for his presence. And he'll come anywhere you are. Listen, I, I've already been to church this weekend and had me a good one. It was on my Sears riding lawnmower yesterday morning for a couple hours. I need an amen from somebody. Listen, listen, I, one of the best gifts I ever got. You ever get a dumb gift for Christmas? Anybody? Just what were you thinking? But one of the best gifts I ever got is, is a pair of 3M uh, construction headphones, and they're to save your ears, but they also are Bluetooth, and so you can connect to your Pandora and listen to your music. And I was just riding along yesterday, sweating in the hot sun, sticky with grass all over me, just praising and worshiping God. Amen, anybody? So it's not necessarily about the house, but it's about your desire for the one who can fill the house. So the first week we talked about the fact that God had them take up an offering to build the temple, and then we talked about his presence coming in and filling the temple. Probably going to mention that a little bit more today. And then last week we talked about the Ark of the Covenant, and we talked about the God of Covenant and, and the three aspects of the covenant. You can go back and watch those messages on our Facebook page. They're there, and, uh, and get caught up if you've missed them. But today I want to talk about bread. Somebody say bread, please. I want to talk about bread. And uh, let's begin our reading. Um, well, it, yeah, he's got my title up, Bread in the House. Uh, Bread in the House. So let's go. Exodus chapter 25, verse number 23 through 30. Now, this is the second set of instructions. He's already given the instructions on how to build the Ark of the Covenant. And if you're in your Bibles, we're just following right along. You say, well, are you going to preach on the lampstand? Yep. Are you going to preach on the altar? Yep. Anything else? I'm not sure. But those two, the lampstand and the altar, be ready for those. Then make a table of acacia wood, 36 inches long, 18 inches wide, and 27 inches high. Go ahead. Overlay it with pure gold and run a gold molding around the edge. Decorate it with a three-inch border all around and run a gold molding along the border as well. Uh, make four gold rings. Do y'all remember that from last week? Anybody? Y'all with me this morning? Okay, make four gold rings for the table and attach them at the four corners next to the four legs. Uh, attach the rings near the border to hold the poles that are used to carry the table, okay? Make these poles from acacia wood, overlay them with gold. We're almost done. Make special containers of pure gold for the table. Bowls, ladles, pitchers, and jars to be used in pouring out liquid offerings. And then finally, verse 30, place the bread of the presence. Now, this is pretty cool. Place the bread of the presence on the table to remain before me, please help me finish, last three words, at all times. The bread of the presence. The King James Version of the Bible calls it the shoe bread, S-H-E-W-B-R-E-A-D. Most other versions call it the show bread, S-H-O-W-B-R-E-A-D. And the New Living Translation calls it the bread of the presence. Now, that, what, what that means is this bread was to be laid out continuously in the presence of God. 
in the presence of God. So I had some thoughts that I just wanted to give to you. Usually, I might keep my points pretty short. These are a little bit longer if you're a note taker, my apologies. I wanted to talk first about the incredible privilege of his presence. The incredible privilege of his presence. And maybe I should begin by saying, please don't ever take for granted the presence of God. You see, the Bible said there was a man named Samson, and he began to take for granted the presence of God. And he got to a point in his life where he was really in a pickle. And the Bible said that he said to himself, I will now shake myself as I have done in the past and get out of this situation. And the Bible said he didn't know that the Spirit of the Lord had departed from him. I pray God that I never get so spiritually numb that I don't even know when he leaves me. Amen, anybody? Amen. And in Samson's life, you know what it was? It was sin. It was ongoing sin that he kept committing. And even though he was God's called man and God's champion, eventually God forsook him and he paid for it with his life. I need an amen right there. So the incredible privilege of his presence. Now, the shoe bread or the show bread or the bread of the presence, um, I didn't want to bore you with bakery type stuff, so let's just leave it at that. It was a very simple, common type of bread. It was to be made out of fine flour, not coarse flour. And they actually had some molds, and they would cook 12 loaves in these molds so that they were all shaped the same. Are you with me so far, please? Now, according to everything that I have read, they would, once a week, they would bake a new set of these, these loaves, 12 of them, one for each of the 12 tribes of Israel. And six priests would come in. It was kind of a ceremony. Two would come in to remove the, the, the 12 that had been there for the last seven days. And while they were removing the 12, uh, another four priests were simultaneously laying out the fresh 12. Now, this bread is, 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 th this bread is not like our wonder bread uh, that, that we buy at the grocery store. Because you might say, man, if bread lays out for seven days, boy, it's going to be bad, ain't it? Well, this, this was more like a, 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 a hard biscuit. And, and so it didn't do it any harm to do that. And as a matter of fact, at the end of the seven days, the priests were to eat that bread within the temple. They didn't take it home with them. They, they were to eat it within the temple. Nobody else was supposed to eat it except the priest. And they would make two piles, and they would put six in this pile and six in this pile, and oftentimes they would dust it on the top with some frankincense, some frankincense. And so this bread was symbolic of the fact that, number one, the 12 tribes of Israel were to be totally committed to God and God alone, Jehovah God. Can I have an amen, please? If you're reading the one-year Bible, this morning we read about a king who didn't follow after his father Jehoshaphat and his grandfather Asa, but he turned to wicked ways and he began to worship other gods and not Jehovah God Almighty. And not only did he pay for it with his life, but the kingdom of Judah paid for his disobedience as well. So the bread of the presence was to symbolize the fact that the 12 tribes were committed to God always. But I can't get away from this fact that they call it the bread of the presence and that these 12 loaves of bread got the incredible privilege of being in the presence of God. They are in the same room as the Ark of the Covenant. If you'll remember last week, we talked about the fact that God said on top of the Ark of the Covenant will be the mercy seat and that's where I will dwell and I will speak to you from the mercy seat. So how fortunate, and you may think, think I'm sounding silly, but stay with me. How fortunate is it that these 12 pieces of bread got to be in the presence of God 24-7? Yeah, yeah. Does that interest anybody else but me? Yeah. You see, I was wrestling with this message. I said, God, what do I preach here? I understand that the bread laid in your presence. I understand how they did it. I even understand why they did it. But God, how does this apply to living faith? And I was actually right over here, which is, as I say all the time, the place that I like to come in and pray. And I was, I was thinking about it. And in my mind's eye, I was going over. Have you noticed so far how meticulous God is as to how he makes, wants everything made in the temple? He, he described the length of the Ark of the Covenant and the width, the depth, and how to make the angels and what to do and how to do the four rings in each corner and then slide the poles through the rings so you could pick up the Ark on your shoulders and, and carry the Ark. And then this table, put the rings in there and make the poles big enough and slide the poles through the rings and then pick up the table and carry it. Did you know that God told them how long to make each one of the curtains to hang over the, the framework? Did you know that God told them how many silver lamps or uh, stands to make? Like what are at the base? 
use of these two flags to hold the poles straight up and down because there was a great big wooden framework and then they would throw uh, pieces of material over it to form the tent. And God even told them exactly how many curtain rings to make. I mean, he was so meticulous. He laid it out. It needs to be this long. It needs to be this deep. It needs to be this high. It needs to be this wide. He gave them all of these plans. And I was in here and I was praying and I was thinking about it. And then I started thinking about how many of these things were to be of solid gold or overlaid with solid gold. And I was going to go back and try and weigh it all up. And I imagine if you Google it, you could have it in 30 seconds on your phone right now. Put your phone in your pocketbook. Don't pull it out right now. But uh, is anybody still with me this morning? So I'm just thinking about this, and I'm thinking about the light inside the, the Holy of Holies, and I'm, I'm thinking about how it's reflecting off the top of this pure gold table and, and this pure gold ark, and man, I can't wait one day when I get to glory to see the Ark of the Covenant. Anybody else? And you know the cool thing? I'm going to get to touch it, amen, somebody? And, and I'm not going to get struck dead by it. So guys, maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm just a nerd, but I'm sitting here thinking about the fact of all these beautiful golden instruments cups and saucers and, and bowls and pitchers and utensils and the table's made of gold and the lampstand's made of gold and the Ark of the Covenant is made of gold. And I'm thinking of all this beauty that is hidden. Because not a one of you in this room would be eligible to even peek under the bottom of the tent. And me either. What a waste. I've never been to the Louvre in Paris, but I've heard of some of the, the paintings that hang there. And I have been to several of the Smithsonian's in Washington, but not all of them. Lord, if you go to all of them, you need two weeks. I've seen some beautiful things. I've seen the Hope Diamond. Anybody? I've seen uh, the Crown Jewels were on display there when we went, when Missy and I went. Now you can see it, but you can't what? You find out real, real fast what a taser feels like. Amen, somebody? <laughs> or, or maybe even the real thing, not the taser. And I was over here praying, and I was just in my mind's eye. It's not a vision. I was just, I've got a vivid imagination. I was just thinking about the ark, and I was thinking about the table, and I was thinking about the bread that laid in the presence of God. And I thought, but nobody got to go in there except ever so often the priest and, 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 and him only one. Wow. The incredible privilege of his presence. May we never take for granted the presence of God. You could read about the temple, but you couldn't go in and see it. You could read about the showbread, the shoe bread, or the bread of his presence, but you couldn't eat it. You could read about it, but, but you couldn't eat it. You don't know what it tastes like. What a tragedy. Somebody say tragedy, please. What a tragedy to be denied the presence of God. Because he said, build me a holy sanctuary so I can be with you. I want to be with you. But, but to be denied, the tragedy of being denied the presence of God. But before we, we leave it at that, I think about David and some things that David had to say about the presence of God. Is anybody interested? Spoiler alert, this first one is one I use a lot. It's one of my all-time favorites. I mean, it's a Sean verse. It's, it's one of my heart verses. Does anybody have some heart verses? They're just really special to you. This one is to me. It's Psalm 16 and 11. Here's what David said. You will show me the path of life. That means he's never going to leave me to walk alone. Amen, somebody. Secondly, in your presence, oh, David knew something about the presence of God. In your presence, there is what? Fullness of joy, and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Anybody like that verse right there? How about this one? Psalm 91 and 1. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. How about that one, y'all? How about this one? David said, Psalm 17, hide me, hide me under the shadow of your wings. Does anybody else have times when you got to run and hide in God because the enemy's hot on your heels and you don't know what else to do? Does anybody feel like right now it'd be a good place to praise the Lord in this house? Well, then go ahead. 
But how did David know all this? He wasn't a priest. He wasn't of the tribe of Levi. He was of the tribe of Judah. Judah were the musicians and, some, and, and the singers and the praisers. Yes, yeah, sometimes they were, but they were also the warriors. The Levites were the ones that were supposed to be taking care of the house. The tribe of Levi was uh, where, where they come from. David wasn't a priest. How did he know about the presence of God? How could he say that? So obviously there's something, something going on here about the presence of God. But we came today to talk about bread, didn't we? Amen, somebody? Didn't we? Somebody say bread, please. So when we eat together, sometimes we call it, somebody guess it for me out loud. Go ahead. Say it louder. Breaking bread. Somebody say breaking bread. Old-fashioned way to say it. We're going to go break bread together. You remember when Jesus took the bread and he broke it? It's kind of crusty. It's kind of crusty. Oftentimes they would take it and dip it in something to soften it up. That's why it could last for seven days. Give me an amen to somebody. Now, I, I want you to know, if you go home and put your Wonder Bread out on the table, it's going to mold. All right? I'm just going to let you know. No scientist, but I have learned that. But breaking bread is eating together. And when you dine with someone, Noah, it is a sign of fellowship and peace. You don't normally eat meals with your enemies, do you? Amen, anybody? This message is just all over the place, ain't it? I'm just grabbing stuff here and grabbing stuff here. Just pray for me. Maybe I can make it make sense and bring it in for a landing. Amen? Please pray for me. Dining with someone is a sign of fellowship and peace. I, okay, okay. I got to say it again then. Dining with someone is a sign of fellowship and peace. It means a lack of strife, a lack of division. Come on, help me. A lack of warfare. Come on, help me. A lack of, a lack of struggle. Come on, help me, y'all. A lack of, 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 of uh, uh, the attack. A lack of, of, of stress. Come on, get, come on, get this. Dining with someone usually, I, mm, I don't want to eat with somebody that I'm mad at or they're mad at me. How about that? Amen, somebody? That's not a very good meal, is it, when you're eating with somebody you don't like? Or, or they don't like you. Come on, help me. All right, let me bust it up in here. One of my favorite figures all time in history is Sir Winston Churchill. Amen, somebody? And he was known to be rather opinionated. He would say things when didn't care what people thought. And he was at a dinner one night, and he'd been speaking for a while, and a woman was taking great offense at what he said. She said, sir, if you were my husband, I would give you poison. He said, madam, if you were my wife, I would drink it. How's my accent, Chris? <laughs> eh, not bad. So somebody put that on Facebook. <laughs> but give Sir, Sir Winston credit. Um, dining with someone is a sign of fellowship and peace. Okay, pastor, you've read it like six times. We got it. Okay, then let's look at Revelation 3.20 then because Jesus said, look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal Help, together as friends. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to run back with your indulgence. I'm going to run back to my Wednesday night lesson and read you a quote. You ready? God will stand at the closed doors of our lives by which we have shut God out and imprisoned ourselves within. And the love of God's grace will knock and knock and knock and knock with a knock of confrontation on those doors. But God will never force open the doors. He watches to see the door move from within. Did you all get that? When we shut the doors, we lock him out and we lock ourselves in. Come on, give me an amen right there. And he knocks and he knocks and he knocks and he waits to see it. He won't force it. He waits to see us open and say, Okay, Lord, come on in. What is the significance of Jesus coming in and having a meal with us in John 6 and 35? He said, I am the bread of life. Where are you? No, I need you, buddy. There we go. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. He is the bread of life. I'd like to ask you, living faith, a question this morning. That is this. Are you hungry for something more? Is anybody else hungry for something more? In Matthew chapter 5, in verse number 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they 
shall be filled. I want to be filled and filled again and then filled again and then filled again and then filled tomorrow. Come on, somebody. And be filled while I'm riding on my lawnmower. Come on, somebody. I want to be filled when I'm just driving down the road. Come on, somebody. I want, the pre- I want to be like the showbread. I want to be in the presence of God always, not just sometimes, always, always. I don't ever want to be absent. Come on, somebody. When I get absent from him is when I start getting in trouble. John, when I get away from the presence of God is when I'm fair game for the enemy. Somebody needs to listen to me this morning. When I get away from the presence of God, I'm all alone standing out there on the Serengeti. The pack has left me and the lions are circling and ready to devour. But when I'm in his presence, oh, I wish somebody would help me. I wish somebody would praise him in this house. When I'm in the presence of God, he has to stand out there and watch. He can't get near me. David said, you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. Oh, you better, talk, you, better, you better pull the battery out of the back of me. I'm starting to feel this one this morning. Oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. The smell, the smell of fresh bread. Amen, anybody? Joel, will you come on up and, and play, son, please? I ain't a big Walmart fan. Can I have an Amen. Man, I hate when I have to go in Walmart. Anybody? Wow, thank God for Dollar General. Amen, somebody? (laughs) We got one right next door. Just run in and get a gallon of milk. Good to go. I mean, in and out, gone. Not the lines and the worry about it. There's only one good thing about Walmart rinking, and that is Subway. (laughs) Have you ever walked in Walmart rinking and smelled the fresh bread being cooked? Man, bread ain't no good for me. Amen, anybody else? If you one of the little skinny people can eat anything and, and not gain a pound, I hate you in Jesus' name. <laughs> so many mornings. I have figured out that's the best time. If you got to go in Walmart, the best time is to go in the morning. And one of the reasons is that smell of fresh bread in the house. Y'all remember my sermon title this morning? Bread in the house. There's an aroma that can come off of a healthy church. And there's an aroma that can come off of an unhealthy church too. And when God commanded them to build that table, chapter 25, verse number 30, he said this, place the bread of the presence on the table to remain before me at all times. At all times. At all times. So, Now this third part of this message is I have a responsibility as the pastor but it's not on me alone. You and I have a responsibility to make sure that there's always bread in the house. They say too many cooks spoil the broth. Well, in this instance, that's wrong because the more you and I together in unity and the spirit make welcome the presence of God the sweeter the aroma will be coming out of the temple come on hungry people spiritually need the bread of life we got it but we need to give it a man that preached when I was a teenager his name is Gene Rice and he, he's an old, old man now. He's still living, but I haven't seen him in any meetings in a long, long time. And, uh, but I remember him preaching one time. He said, do you know what the gospel is? The gospel is one beggar giving another a piece of bread. That makes it good, doesn't it? It makes it easy. The bread of life that we have consumed, Jesus said, freely you have received freely give oh God I want the aroma of the bread of life to fill my life and this church can you say that this morning if you can will you come up and join me in the altar today 